At the dawn of the 25th of June, 1950, the North Korean army crossed the border into South Korea, marking the beginning of the Korean War. Although the South Korean intelligence accurately predicted the North Korean invasion, incompetence within the leadership and the government resulted in the South Koreans being completely underprepared. While the South Koreans were busy being underprepared, the North Koreans were busy assembling a formidable invasion force consisting of nearly 300 tanks, 200 artillery pieces, and 200,000 troops in preparation for the war. The war to unify the country, the people of Korea, once and for all. The South Koreans, in complete disarray, resorted to conscripting every able-bodied man to encounter the invasion force. Even young boys, students in high school, and some as young as middle school, volunteered to defend their nation. And to lead conscripted men, you'd need officers. And there was a critical shortage of them after the communism purge that the nation had just gone through. Desperate times certainly called for desperate measures. And in their desperation, the South Korean government was willing to do whatever they could to fill these officer positions. The Korean War would see Park Chung-hee reinstated as an officer in the army once again. Around this time, Park Chung-hee would divorce his first wife and remarry to a second wife, Yuk Young-soo. Because this marriage wasn't arranged, he loved her dearly, and together they would have three children, Park Geun-hye, Park Geun-young, and Park Ji-man. I now pronounce you husband and wife. By the way, is this the best time to be doing this? During the war, Park Chung-hee did what he did best, climbing quickly up the ranks, even becoming division commander by the end of the war. He was destined to be in the military. After the war ended, Park Chung-hee would continue to serve in the army, even becoming a brigadier general by the year 1957, and major general the following year. It was an astonishing rise. With sheer hard work, dedication, and his refusal to quit, even working unpaid in the army, and by having made friends in high places combined with some convenient timing, Park Chung-hee became one of the most powerful people in South Korea in the span of just 10 years. It would also be around this time that the first president of South Korea, Lee Seung-man, due to immense pressure and demonstrations from the public, resigned from office in an event called the April Revolution, replacing the previous oppressive ruler with a parliamentary-style government called the Second Republic of Korea. The bar had been set so low that there was absolutely no room but up from here. Oh, hey, look, it didn't get better at all. Years of incompetency from Lee Seung-man's rule hardly did anything to repair the nation from the recent civil war, a civil war that left millions dead and destroyed the majority of the country's infrastructure. Critical power shortages meant electricity was scarcely available even in the capital, let alone in the rural parts of South Korea. Food shortages leaving the people so desperate that they resorted to scavenging the mountains for whatever they could find. Mountains that were also completely destroyed. It was even said that North Korean's economic and industrial output was greater than that of the South during the 1950s. Needless to say that North Korea completely blew the lead on that one. To make matters worse, the new parliament was split between the president and the prime minister, causing a power struggle, resulting in yet another ineffective government. While the government bickered amongst themselves, the public, not seeing any reform, continued to demonstrate for change. Nothing had changed at all. Park Chung-hee was among the people that was unhappy with the way that the government was being run. And as it turns out, he wasn't the only officer unhappy with this ineffective new government either. Park Chung-hee, with the help of the army chief of staff, Chang Do-young, would later form the Military Revolutionary Committee in secrecy. This committee would include some of the highest ranking officers within the South Korean military, also dissatisfied with the government. Park Chung-hee never gave up on his dream to overthrow the government. And now, with the backing of the army chief of staff, he had the support of the entire army behind him. Shortly after the formation of the committee, Park Chung-hee heard the news that he may be even fired from the position in the army entirely. 
time was running out. And now that Park Chung-hee was in an undisputed power of position, with the backing of some of the most powerful senior officers in the military, it was time to act. On the 16th of May, 1961, a massive portion of the Republic of Korea's 1st and 2nd Field Army mobilized and seized critical infrastructures in the capital. Power plants, phone stations, radio stations, police headquarters in Seoul, City Hall, and even the Lotte Hotel, where the majority of government officials were staying at the time. By doing so, Park Chung-hee and his committee had complete control of the communications from the government. Simultaneously, other branches and groups of the military rallied behind Park Chung-hee and his cause. 6th Artillery Corps in Eastern Seoul, 33rd Division in Southern Seoul, 5th Division in Northern Seoul, the 1st Marine Brigade, Air Force Corps, and even troops outside of the capital in Gwangju and Busan all joined in. This incident is known as the May 16th coup and is seen as one of the major turning points in modern Korean history. With the might of the military backing the coup, the parliament, prime minister, and the president had no choice but to capitulate, effectively handing over their power to the new military revolutionary committee, with the president remaining merely as a figurehead in order to give the new regime legitimacy. The Second Republic of Korea had lasted for just one year. Park Chung-hee's May 16th coup had been executed with impeccable precision, cooperation, and coordination. The Military Revolutionary Committee would later be reorganized into the Supreme Council for National Reconstruction, with Chang Do-young as the chairman and Park Chung-hee as the vice chairman. However, Chang Do-young held moderate values such as wanting to keep the previous president in place. His moderate stance proved to be extremely unpopular with the newly created council. So, Park Chung-hee and his cronies within the council implemented strict laws to restrict the influence of the chairman, eventually having Chang Do-young and his followers arrested for charges of conspiring against the nation. Chang Do-young would later be exiled to the United States, and Park Chung-hee appointed himself as the new chairman, marking the beginning of the Third Republic of Korea. In addition, the Korean Central Intelligence Agency would be formed, or the KCIA for short. This clandestine organization would be tasked with gathering both international and domestic intelligence, as well as identifying, tracking, and arresting any other counter-revolutionary movements within the country. The KCIA held immense power, and they were free to act without warrants from the judge or follow due process of the law. They were the law. They would wiretap, arrest, kidnap, and torture anyone suspected of communist activities. Even the press were arrested for reporting and publishing material that spoke out against the new government. However, under the pressure from the United States, Park Chung-hee would promise to hold free elections the following year. And to his credit, he would keep his word. In the ensuing free election, Park Chung-hee narrowly defeated his opponent, the previous president, by a margin of 1%. Regardless, now that he had secured his presidency through more legitimate means, he wasted no time in springing into action. You see, Park Chung-hee's end goal wasn't to merely become the president. He never lost sight of his primary goal. His goal to lift his nation, Korea, out of poverty and project its greatness to the world. Okay, so you have just become the president of a cripplingly poor nation. What do you do? Well, we know that the world reserve currency is the US dollar, and that means we use this dollar to buy more stuff, like oil and building power plants to provide electricity for your people, and investing in agriculture to produce food. Well, then how do we get more of that American dollar? You can earn it much like how we earn money in society today, such as performing a service, or creating products and selling them to other countries. And since you kinda need money to start creating products, I guess that mostly just leaves services. In order to get that American dollar into the theoretical bank account of South Korea, Park Chung-hee and his administration began immediately establishing international partnerships. Money, essentially, 
in exchange for Korean services. Thousands of workers were sent across the world. Nurses and miners were sent to West Germany in exchange for capital for domestic development. Scientists and engineers were sent to Iran and Saudi Arabia in exchange for oil and money for domestic development. At the request of the United States, Pak Chung Hee also sent hundreds of thousands of troops to Vietnam in exchange for, that's right, that sweet, sweet American dollar. South Korea had, in essence, become a mercenary, exchanging soldiers for economic aid. It is even said that 40% of all export dollars over a nine-year period came from the form of U.S. payment from the participation of Korean troops in the Vietnam War. Despite being the poorest country that participated on the side of the Americans, they contributed the second largest fighting force in the war. The South Korean military proved to be courageous and resourceful, proving to be a valuable ally to South Vietnam and the United States. In addition, South Korea's military would also benefit greatly through technology transfers, and it would be here South Korea's military began to modernize rapidly. However, South Korean troops in Vietnam were also noted for their brutality to the Vietnamese civilians. It is estimated that South Korean troops were responsible for the deaths of nearly 8,000 civilians, being involved in upwards of 40 massacres and mass killings. These massacres were not published until the 1990s, the effects of which can be witnessed to the present day. Back in South Korea, in order to start exporting products out of the country, Pak Chung Hee's administration created massive incentives for companies, such as providing cheaper steel, tax breaks, and loans from the government. Companies that met their export quotas were rewarded with even greater incentives. Companies like Hyundai, commonly known for their automotive manufacturing today, actually got their humble start by moving equipment around for the US military. By leveraging these incentives provided by Pak Chung Hee and his administration, their rinky-dink transport company later expanded into construction, eventually becoming one of the largest construction companies in the country. By 1970, they would even build the country's first highway. It wouldn't be until 1975, a full eight years after Hyundai was first founded, that they would start to produce automobiles with their own domestic factory. Hyundai would later expand their business portfolio into cement production, chemical manufacturing, and even shipping, just to name a few, growing larger and larger. All industries supported by Pak Chung Hee's plan to industrialize the country. It would also be around this time foreign companies utilized cheap Korean labor to start manufacturing and packaging electronics. Seeing its potential, Pak Chung Hee's administration fostered and advocated for the growth of the Korean electronics industry by designating special electronics manufacturing zones, zones where companies could research and develop local electronic products for export, like radios, TV, and even semiconductors and computers. By leveraging government incentives and establishing international partnerships, successful companies dominated their competition, amassing unimaginable levels of wealth, turning into megacorporations. These megacorporations are called chebals in Korean, translating into wealthy clan or family. This is important to note because just as the name implies, many of these megacorporations are run by descendants and families of the founders, in effect making them a family-run monopoly. Despite their shortcomings in labor regulations and monopolistic nature, the chebals succeeded in bringing in American dollars to the country and providing citizens with jobs. With these new funds, Pak Chung Hee and his administration brought sweeping changes to the nation. Rural villages went through modernization under his new village movement, 24-hour electricity to all homes and businesses, paved roads, running water, trees were replanted to war-torn landscapes. Heavy industrial equipment invested into agriculture, steadily increasing grain yield. Highways and expressways were built, connecting the cities. South Korea began to emerge from the rubbles of the Korean War. Pak Chung Hee's plan was working. This is amazing. 
There's one thing that you forgot about, though. Your insane communist neighbor that lives just above you, North Korea. Park Chung-hee was a devout anti-communist, and that made North Korea a little nervous. If you think the drama between the two countries over North Korea's recent missile testings are crazy, you haven't seen anything yet. In 1968, in the cover of darkness, 31 North Korean special forces agents were sent to the south under disguise. Their mission: assassinate Park Chung-hee and cause a state of panic in the south. <laughs> <laughs> 